thank you. Uh, it's a great, great pleasure to be here. Uh, many of you already pointed out how Samf Samson influenced you in, in your scientific careers, uh, learning about his work from his papers. Uh, I first encountered Samson's name and him, in some sense, through a textbook uh, when I was studying gauge theories. Uh, and that kind of brings me uh, into the context which I wanted to uh, kind of uh, emphasize. And that's the development of gauge theories, not only uh, anomalies, integrability, uh, that is usually emphasized. So if you look historically in the 1970s, gauge theories have been paid lots of attention by some wonderful people, some of them are teachers of, of Samson's and many, many of you in the audience. And then in the early 80s, a uh, little bit more subtle questions were remaining to be solved, uh, many of them truly to anomalies, but many others as well. And Samson and his generations, again, some of in this audience participated and, and created that wonderful um, theory which, uh, which is going to last and be uh, applicable to nature as well as to our deeper understanding of how field theories work. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, same applies to his later work on, uh, on, on integration on the modular space of instantons, again, understanding gauge theories in a deeper level. So it's a, uh, it's a wonderful uh, uh, subject and perhaps worthy of new textbooks now. So with that, uh, I'm going to talk about effective field theory. Uh, this theory is not yet as developed as ordinary non-abelian gauge theories, theories for, for, uh, vec for, for vector fields. Uh, it's a theory of a tensor field. As you know, and as you know, uh, in those sorts of contexts, we are encountering all sorts of uh, issues already in the mass massless general relativity. Uh, and what I'll be talking about is a massive extension of general relativity and uh, issues that are encountered in that context are specific to that theory, and that's what I want to talk, talk about and see some uh, future, um, wh whether in future we can resolve them. So let me begin with motivations. I'm going to have two slides for motivations. One is more theoretical, and it's the theoretical slide, and another one is uh, cosmological. For the theory, uh, we know that uh, if you ask um, what's the theory of a massless spin 2, uh, in a, in a world in which, which preserves Lorentz invariance, um, then the representations of the Poincare group tell you that, you know, has to have, that, that state has to have two degrees of freedom, and we know how to write the Lagrangian, and that's a unique Lagrangian, which we call general relativity. So uh, classically, it's a good theory. Quantum mechanically, you can quantize this as an effective field theory, and what will happen is that it will break down at the scale, which is at the order of M Planck. But if you are interested in observables below that, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great theory, in fact. So the question we'd like to understand, if you, have, if you can have a similar story for a massive spin 2. Again, the moment I pronounce these words, massive spin 2, I imply underlying Poincare invariance of the world uh, at short scales. Uh, then you, we have to have five degrees of freedom according to the group representation. And hence, you have to write the, down the Lagrangian which propagates five degrees of freedom on an arbitrary background. Uh, so that's a, that's a theoretical question. And then the next question is, what is the scale at which that theory breaks down as an effective field theory? Well, we do have examples, as you know, of uh, massive spin two states. Uh, Kaluza clients are massive spin twos. Uh, in QCD, there are uh, massive spin two globals. I don't know if Shine will be talking about <laughs> some of them, but, well, they are massive spin to globals, but also massive spin to, you know, quark anti-quark states and things like this. They do exist in nature. Well, regex states uh, have typically also massive spin twos. But the uh, interesting point is that in all these examples, massive spin twos comes with, come together with someone else. It's very hard to arrange for situations in which you separate scale of a massive spin two from higher states. It will be fine to separate, let's say, massless states and then just one massive spin two, that, that actually would be something that I would be interested in, but decouple it from, uh, in general, infinite number of other states. Uh, in particular, if you look at the kaluza klein theories, at the linearized level, each, each, you know, each, each massive spin two has the Lagrangian, which is, you know, which is field power Lagrangian, the only consistent one, but the, for the full consistency of the theory, uh, at the nonlinear level, the next level and the next level, they all mix together and contribute and, and make theory consistent just that way. Uh, so there is, no, there is no parameter by which you can really separate the next Kaluza claim from the previous one. 
And same applies uh, to QCD. So in QCD, if you take large n limit to decouple states from each other, then you also lose self-interaction of those globals. For sure, you know, massive spin two global can by itself be described by fields power Lagrangian. That's fine, but uh, the question is what the nonlinear interactions are. And that's what I'll be uh, addressing. So I want to have a theory of a standalone massive spin tool. Uh, and the question is whether it's possible or not. So now fr for, from a uh, more cosmology uh, applications point of view, uh, th th this sort of theories emerged uh, as an attempt to describe dark energy. Uh, I should say that today we have a perfect parameterization of what's, what's seeing in the sky. Uh, we just write down the Einstein equation, well, Friedman equation, which is a zero, zero component, stick in energies and, and matter that we believe uh, are existing in the universe, and that includes dark matter, dark energy, and dark energy we typically parameterize by the cosmological constant, and that all fits data. There is no, there is no issue there. <coughs> uh, nevertheless, uh, people pursue alternatives to that description, first because uh, well, I don't know if it's first or not, but one reason is, is because the cosmological constant, as you, say, as you know, is, is unstable with respect to quantum loop corrections. There is a tremendous fine tuning involved setting up that number that small. Uh, but other, more, again, more practical reason is that if you have an alternative scenario in which predicts different type of uh, observables, then uh, perhaps you can measure and distinguish the theories from each other. So, in, so both of these, these lines of thoughts are pursued, so that's why other theories are being looked. And massive gravity is one of them. Um, and uh, so not only the reason why you would think mass, massive graviton would give you something like dark energy is uh, the, the, the argument is similar to a scalar field theory. If you have a massless scalar, that doesn't have negative pressure. That cannot produce negative pressure. Uh, in order to produce negative pressure, you have to have the mass term or the potential term. Right, the mass term being the simplest one that would give you negative pressure. And as you know, the cosmological dark energy, cosmological constant, uh, necessarily has uh, negative pressure. That's the uh, defining feature of it. So, so with that argument, you would think that perhaps if you have massive graviton, uh, that mass term would give you uh, something similar to the cosmological constant. And you, you, you will see that it really works that way precisely. Uh, and physically, what it is is that this is some kind of condensate of, of massive, uh, massive gravitons, in fact, the helicity zero states of those massive gravitons that gives you the accelerated expansion. So uh, another one is, uh, of course, the long-standing problem of the old cosmological constant, uh, whether that can be solved in this context. Uh, in fact, uh, historically, uh, you may be aware that when Einstein introduced the cosmological constant, he thought that was a mass term. And that actually, that was the reason why he introduced the cosmological constant, because he wanted to have static universe and as everything else in Einstein is very physical, he said, oh, how I make universe static? Uh, well, if I screen gravity, if I have it Yukawa screened as opposed to, you know, 1 OR Newtonian, then that screening somehow should stop uh, the, the expansion that otherwise he was seeing in his equation in, in uh, time-dependent equations as we know now. Uh, that's, that's why he introduced the cosmological constant. He thought it was a graviton mass. But we know that the cosmological constant is not a graviton mass simply because it doesn't change the degrees of freedom. It's still a theory with two degrees of freedom. But in any case, the question is whether that logic uh, that Einstein had of screening of things at very large distances perhaps can be used to screen this big cosmological constant. That was another reason why these theories are explored. And uh, the, the last one, I won't elaborate too much unless uh, the questions are about that. This, this emerged through, the, uh, through, the, you know, through work on these theories. Uh, not that somebody would, would, could predict this. Uh, some of these theories, in particular what, what are called bi-gravity theories, these are, these are theories of one massless and one massive graviton that uh, Costas covered very nicely uh, yesterday. So those have a chance to offer alternative descriptions of very early universe. And uh, uh, again, that's a huge subject that I, I, I won't necessarily be talking about. Okay, let me now go to uh, the issue that I'd like to talk about, and that that's a question about degrees of freedom and their interactions. <coughs> so as I mentioned already, the massive spin two would have three more degrees of freedom as compared to massless uh, spin two, and the question is how those, those additional degrees of freedom are self-interacting or in interacting with other stuff. And you can ask the same question for a massive spin one, non-abelian massive spin one, as it was done 
uh, very long ago, uh, even before Samsung. <laughs> so, so take SU2 for simplicity, um, so lo local SU2 I'm talking about, uh, and put in, uh, in, in addition to the young mills term, put in the, the mass term by hand. Uh, and that, that's what actually Glashow did in 1962. That's part of the standard model in a sense. Uh, and there is no, there is no issue with gauge invariance or something. You can always restore gauge invariance by introducing Schuckelberg fields and so on and so forth. Uh, the only question is how that theory differs from the massless one in terms of, let's say, high energy behavior. Uh, and and uh, it, it does in a very significant way uh, because of precisely those uh, additional degrees of freedom. So as you know, each massive spin one would have extra one degree of freedom. That would be helicity zero uh, state. Uh, and because it's SU2, now you have three of them. So this A, these pi A's, these are longitudinal degrees of freedom of three massive gauge bosons. A runs from one to three. So that's what pi A's are. And then you can go to a certain limit. It's called decoupling limit. That's essentially, physically, it's a high energy limit. You're going at energies which are higher than the mass scale. Uh, and in a weakly coupling uh, approximation, and you can extract uh, the, the terms from your Lagrangian, which are the strongest in that limit. And these are the ones uh, calculated in that paper uh, for, uh, for the longitudinal polarizations. And as you see, the, well, this is some kind of nonlinear sigma model. But as you see, uh, it breaks down as an effective field theory. If you start quantizing it now, perturbatively, uh, uh, then it breaks down at the scale v. So if you expand this, the leading term will be d pi, d pi, pi square over v squared. And if you look at the quartic scattering amplitude of four pi's, that amplitude will uh, be violating perturbative unitarity at the scale of v. Uh, and hence, uh, that's the validity of this effective field theory. Uh, so something needs to come, so you have two options. Either you declare that that's the theory, well, perturbative it weighs down, but you know, you can do maybe non-perturbative calculations. You can actually need to do lattice calculations or something like this, but there is no, so, so clearly what we'll be producing is some kind of bound states of those pi's about that scale v, and then it's, 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 it's difficult to uh, analytically to address that, but, but you know, it might be theory by itself. Uh, looks like in the standard model, the nature ch chose, well, we know that it chose different route. And there, there is that, there is an additional particle. It, on top of this polarization, there is an additional particle, which we hold, call the Higgs boson. And that Higgs boson comes in and cancels those growing amplitudes uh, so that the resulting theory is still weakly coupled. So you can do perturbative calculations way beyond the scale V, which in the context of, you know, conventional Higgs, uh, if I were to write down the Higgs model of SU2, this V would have been the mass of the gauge boson divided by the coupling constant. Okay. But still not complete, right, the standard model? Well, because of the uh, Landau pole, but that's a different story, right? So that's entirely different. Oh, if you embed it in a non-abelian group, then it, then it is complete. So that's a different story, yeah. Right. So um, now, the, the, the ideally, that's what you would like to, well, I don't know, ideally or not, that's easy option that you would expect for polarization of gravi massive graviton to interact strongly at some scale. And then perhaps if you were to introduce additional degrees of freedom on top of five, and then those degrees of freedom somehow softening uh, the behavior. But there are uh, now uh, calculations, uh, very nice calculations by these authors who show that Actually, with spin zero, spin a half, and spin one, you cannot really do that cancellation. In the massive gauge case, that was happening due to spin zero. Here, even spin one cannot do it. So perhaps then you should be introducing spin two, but then you might be back to uh, in conversations such as you know infinite towers of kaluza klein modes and so on and so forth. So that's something that we'd like to understand. So to understand that now, let me go to the uh, action or Lagrangian of the massive theory. Uh, in, um, so in general relativity, uh, as, as we mentioned, there are two helicity states of a massless graviton, and we describe them by 10 components of the symmetric tensor G mu nu. The reason why we introduce that redundancy is because that's manifestly covariant formulation, and we don't want to deal with non-covariant formulations. So we introduce extra uh, fields, which are obviously constrained. So here, to describe massive theory, 
you need to introduce yet other extra fields uh, for the you know, full diff invariant formulation. So I'm going to have g mu nu, and then I'm going to have four scalars. So these phi a's, now a runs from 0, 1, 2, 3, and these are scalars of conventional diffeomorphisms. Uh, but internal space metric for these phi a's will be uh, non-compact. It will be, you know, in simple, simplest case, it will be Minkowski. Okay? So that means that one of the signatures will be, uh, well, I call it zero in purpose. It, it will be uh, negative and the other one's positive. Uh, and then from these objects, from these fields, I want to I uh, compose the following matrix. And before the matrix, let me introduce this F tilde. This is called a uh, fiducial metric. So it's d phi, d phi, contracted with internal space um, Minkowski metric. So this whole thing is also a Minkowski metric. I mean, it doesn't have riemann corvica Nevertheless, this is a Minkowski metric in arbitrary coordination. Uh, and uh, so you can think of this as some other metric, as Costas explained uh, yesterday, you can think of it as some other metric which has its own dynamic and for which you've taken its corresponding m Planck to goes to infinity so that you decouple the dynamics. But you can think in both ways depending what questions you want to address. So there is a trivial transition from one to the other. That's not the whole point of all these conversations. So in any case, you, know, you have this, this metric. And then out of this metric and, and the uh, physical metric, you compose a matrix k, which is a unit matrix minus square root of the inverse g times that matrix. Okay, so there is the square root of structure. The reason why it has to be the square root of structure is because I, I already alluded that the, uh, the, the target space of the sigma model is non-compact. And typically, when you write down conventional Lagrangians for some, some, some sigma models like this, you're going to end up with ghosts, precisely because of that non-compactness or the signature that comes from the internal space contractions. And this is the Lagrangian which avoids those ghosts. Because in the end, uh, in a very subtle way, not all four phi's are physical. They get constrained, and only three are physical. And the ones, one that typically would have been non-physical actually get, pro get projected out through the form of this Lagrangian. So, so it took some time to, to construct that. But anyway, we have it now. So then uh, the, the full Lagrangian is the Einstein-Hilbert term. And then the mass term times this, which you can consider as the the mass term, and these are potential, not, you know, some, pot some potential or some interactions of uh, gravitons. Uh, and uh, everything is written in terms of traces of that matrix K that I defined. It, this is trace square minus square of the, uh, uh, trace of the square, uh, which you can also rewrite as that two. That two means epsilon epsilon times two elements, and the other indices is contracted. With between the two epsilons, and then there is that three, and then there is that four, which is a conventional determinant. This is just determinant of this K matrix. And uh, so these, these, these are just obvious notations. So point being is that uh, you cannot write anything else if you want to preserve just five degrees of freedom. The moment you write something else, you're going to get uh, extra six and six degree of freedom, which will be a cost, cost degree of freedom. So, but five is preserved by this structure. Uh, and again, going to the bi-gravity, making a con con connection to the bi-gravity. So if I were to add here a usual Einstein-Hilbert term for this object without necessarily defining it this way, then I would have, uh, I would have the, uh, the bi-gravity theory. So the whole point in, in those theories is what are the cross terms between one graviton and the other graviton. So that was a challenge. Otherwise, these are just Einstein-Hilbert terms. OK, now, uh, well, you, in, again, going back to the gauge fields, we know how uh, symmetry breaking patterns work uh, in, in uh, who eats whom. Uh, here, there is also symmetry breaking pattern. Uh, the, the, the global symmetry is uh, the product of two Poincare s. One, one is obvious. That's, that's what usual you know, space-time Poincare, uh, that, that in our theory we, we use. The other one is the internal space. Uh, Poincare of, that, of those phi. So you can, you can think of that as some kind of target space. And then in the background in, in which uh, this is a massive uh, graviton, uh, let's, say, let's say for simplicity you choose a flat background uh, and you should get as a solution uh, and on it massive graviton propagates, the, uh, there is a breaking of this uh, product group down to the diagonal due to the fact that these phi a's acquire uh, coordinate dependent waves. And in spite of the fact that they are coordinate dependent waves, it doesn't break full uh, Poincare invariance. There is a remnant of Poincare invariance. That's the one that, that we claim we observe in our universe. 
So this uh, is what's going on in the theory. Uh, in the similar decoupling limit that, that I alluded to in the case of uh, massive spin one, you can also define that, that kind of limit here. There, the group is a Galilean group. This is a Galilean group uh, down to the Poincaré. So this is a four, uh, 15 parameter group. Uh, which, which breaks down to, you know, Poincaré through those Galilean fields. So, important um, clarification to this theory is brought by the decoupling limit, as, as it was the case for massive spin one. Uh, and again, physically, this is a limit in which uh, energies are a lot higher than your mass. Uh, so you don't care about those small mass corrections, you care about high energy behavior, and you need that to answer the question as to when this theory breaks down. Uh, and remarkably, uh, you can calculate that limit exactly, and in that limit, you only get finite number of terms. You, uh, initially, you have infinite number of terms, and now you get finite number of terms surviving that limit. So there is, of course, the Einstein-Hilbert part, which is the usual, but then your uh, tensor fluctuation mixes with uh, the following combination of uh, the tensors which are made of the helicity zero state. So this little pi now is a helicity zero for massive graviton. Uh, we apply two derivatives that gives you capital pi. And out of the capital pi, you construct uh, the tensors, uh, like so, x, y, and z. And as you see, these tensors are uh, kinematically conserved. They are automatically conserved. You don't need to use the equations of motion for them to be conserved. So if this were an ordinary scalar, for instance, right? So you would still couple h mu nu to some stuff, some t mu nu of that scalar, and then the conservation of the t mu nu would necessarily uh, invoke the equations of motion of the phi of that scalar. This is not the case here, because this, you don't require to invoke the equations of motion. These are automatically conserved, and actually that is very important for the structure of, of this theory. Uh, so it's then uh, diff invariant. Uh, well, the linearized diffs are the exact symmetry of this theory. In this limit, you have exact symmetry, which is linearized diffs, in spite of the fact that this is a nonlinear theory. Uh, and uh, that tells you that h mu nu will have just two degrees of freedom, like in general relativity, while additional degrees of freedom, one being this pi, will be entirely encoded in this other part of the Lagrangian, which uh, in general you can die. Well, in, in some cases, I'm sorry, I should say, you can diagonalize, in fact, but not always. Okay, so alpha and beta are two arbitrary uh, parameters which are not fixed by this construction. We, uh, we, I already had them in the original Lagrangian, so they stay uh, in this approximation too. Uh, it remains to be seen as to what physical principle uh, fixes them. There are some considerations which reduce the, uh, uh, the parameter space for those uh, alpha and beta, but from the fundamental uh, considerations, they're not really fixed. An interesting fact about them is that they are also not renormalized. So if you now start calculating loops in this theory, which is a nonlinear interacting theory, uh, the loops won't generate any renormalization of alpha and beta. Uh, so I, I can explain that in, uh, in terms of the Galileans, or actually maybe in terms of the tensorial structures, it has something to do precisely with this, these vertices that, uh, that when you have external legs, uh, the, the only ones which have no derivatives on the external legs could, could, could potentially generate renormalization of alpha beta, as, as you see. However, the tensorial structures are such that you always get two momenta uh, uh, acting on the external leg, otherwise everything else is zero, and that has something to do with this, uh, with these tensors here. So alpha and beta are not renormalized, which means that if you go away from the decoupling limit, in the full theory, uh, the terms that I have written will receive corrections, but those corrections will be small. They will be proportional to the mass itself, and then uh, there will be an additional uh, multiplicator, which is the ratio of the mass over m Planck to some power, which means that you know, loop corrections don't really ruin that structure itself. They give you small corrections. Uh, and so you can s certainly generate some other, other things, but that part is protected, and that, that precisely has something to do with the structure in the decoupling limit. So it's somewhat similar with chiral limit of, of QCD, in which you can do a lot. When you take quark masses to zero, you have exact certain exact symmetries, and then you build on those exact symmetries, and then you get into the, into the theory that your corrections due to small uh, you know, up and down masses, sometimes even a strange quark mass. So one connection to uh, um, 
uh, well, something that uh, might interest Samson is, uh, is, is the, uh, the, the nature of those terms uh, in the context of the corset construction. I, I'm not elaborating on it here, but it's a beautiful work done by these people. If you ask a question uh, of, of the following sort, let me start with the Galilean group, which is a symmetry group in this limit. Uh, and uh, it, it breaks down to Poincaré, as I was telling you. Uh, that's a spontaneous breaking. So you can construct a coset, which is Galilean or Poincaré, uh, and you can ask what's the corresponding effective Lagrangian. So you can go through the regular coset constru construction. Uh, you will find out that these terms, these Galilean terms, which are actually diagonalization of this, you don't get, you cannot write them as, as the terms of the uh, effective Lagrangian. So this, again, just to compare with the car perturbation theory in QCD, in QCD would have written all those terms as just the coset terms, conventional coset terms built out of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the construction. Here, you, you, you cannot just write them, so, but you can show that they, has to, they have to be the West Domino terms. That there is a form in one, one dimension more, and you can write that form and take the projection on the back, back reaction on the you know, four-dimensional space in this case, and then you get these terms, so they are like West Domino terms. Now, uh, so let me now explain what the, what the strong coupling problem is and what, at what scale it kicks in. And the simplest way to see that is to look at the, uh, first to look at the linearized part. This is a linearized part uh, of uh, a massive graviton. It, it's, it's just Pierce Pauli Lagrangian, in which I've introdu introduced the Stuckelberg field, this pi. Uh, so trying to extract separately the polarization, helicity zero state. Uh, and this is in the leading order. There are sub-leading orders in mass. Uh, in the leading order, you got, um, you know, kinetic terms for H. This is simplified notation. All the indices are there and so on and so forth. Uh, but structurally, it's just kinetic term for H. And then there is a kinetic mixing between H and the pi, which is proportional to the mass. And then there's a coupling of H to the uh, stress energy uh, tensor. Uh, and as you see, uh, this scale m now is actually irrelevant because you can just rescale pi by that m. Uh, or another way of saying the same thing is that you can first diagonalize this, uh, this kinetic mixing. If you diagonalize, you're going to get the kinetic term for pi, but then also the, the, uh, the interaction of pi with the stress tensor. Uh, and then you can rescale the pi. Uh, and you see that the pi will couple to the stress tensor with equal strengths is the tensor field. Okay, so that's the essence of so-called Van Damme, Weltman, Zaharov discontinuity. That doesn't matter how small a ma mass you take, the, or, or the effect is of order one. In the linearized theory, you have a new effect which is of order one, which is independent of the mass, and the, the, the massive theory differ, differs from massless one by a, or effects of order one. Uh, so that's point number one, and that's typically an issue that needs to be addressed, and there is a Weinstein, what's called Weinstein mechanism to resolve that. Uh, but let me put that aside for a moment. Uh, the related uh, consideration is that you can look now at the nonlinear terms. These are the same terms that I wrote on the previous slide, just in a diagonalized way. And when you rescale the pi, you're going to get the operators like this. As you see, this is a dimension seven operator suppressed by uh, three powers of some scale, right? So in that scale, you can call lambda three. Uh, it's a combination in M-Planck and the mass square to one third power. So that's a scale at which, let's say, uh, two by two scattering of these pi's uh, will start violating perturbative unitarity. Uh, and theory will come out of the uh, perturbative uh, control. Uh, so. So the, 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 so the conclusion then is that, yeah, you can have the theory of standalone massive spin two uh, with just five degrees of freedom. They will be preserved in uh, almost all meaningful backgrounds. And that theory will have strong interaction at this scale, uh, which of course, if you use uh, cosmological values of M, this is very, uh, very low. But theoretically, we want to understand how that scale may potentially be softened or resolved by new physics or other physics, such as the Higgs particle in the case of the uh, massive spin one. So my talk, actually, the rest of my talk, uh, after this cosmology example I will give you quickly, is, is going to be about that aspect, how to go beyond lambda three scale uh, in, the, in the UV. So before, yes? As it was important in the first part that 
Um, you were saying there are five degrees of freedom uh, for general background. You can have a classical background where the square root business becomes sick, you know, yeah. and so which would be low energy. So there could be background where the theory becomes what happens then in this. Well, it's I wouldn't say the theory becomes. Uh, those are not. Would there be a, fee, a six degree of freedom? No, no. Those will be just uh, not. They, there, there is a big class, but some of them are not solution. Some of them are not meaningful solution of, of this of this theory. So, so what Thibault is alluding to, you know, what's the square root of the matrix, and and uh, you know, let's say uh, actually it's it's also not uniquely defined. Square root of the matrix is not uniquely defined. You have multiple solutions. So, that, but you can you can put that on on a very solid uh, classical uh, theory background, which is that I can I can f f to answer that question I can. I write this Lagrangian exactly the same way, where k is in the, an independent matrix now. It's not defined yet in, the, in these units. It's just independent matrix. And then I have a constraint which enforces the quadratic equation for k. And that quadratic equation either has a sol real solution or it doesn't have a real solution, depending on the matter and energy in your theory. And that, that's easier to precisely answer the important question that you are raising. For some cases, you will have uh, also, depending on boundary conditions, we'll have reasonable solutions. In some cases, that quadratic equation will, will have some complex uh, K or whatnot, and those are not solutions in your theory. You reach them during the Cauchy evolution. Yes. So, yeah, you should, yes, physically, physically, you should, you, you, the, your, your Cauchy problem should be defined in a way that you start with conventional Cauchy data and then you evolve so that you never go into those branches. So, these are typically done by boundary conditions. So, yeah, yeah. So, so th this was a quick slide about uh, you know cosmology of the. I mean, this is not doing a fair uh, treatment of it. There is there is a big amount of uh, work, uh, actually very good work on that. But this just to make a point that the Sitter-like solution is a generic kind of generic solution in this theory. So you can you can the way you can think about this. Yes. Uh, you did mention how to step, sidestep the fifth force. Yes. So fi fifth force. Uh, that, that's a very important question. Um, Again, uh, and, and probably the, the rest of my talk would have taken that. So, so the, w the way that traditionally is uh, solved that problem within the theory of just five degrees of freedom, this is called the Weinstein mechanism. And what it does is that you, you, due to the nonlinear terms, your linearized approximation breaks down very, very far from your classical object. This is somewhat counterintuitive when you think to begin with, but then you know there is a second level of intuition for which is perfect. So if, even if you take a you know a planet, no no issues with the tensor modes. Tensor modes are all weak. Those pi modes, uh, they come out of the perturbative regime far away, far away. I mean, if you take a solar, if I remember right, if you take a solar mass object in isolation, the scale at which uh, the perturbative treatment of the pi stops is something like a kiloparsec or something like that. So astronomical scale. So within that kiloparsec, you cannot do perturbation theory for that pi. It just breaks down right there. And that's called the Weinstein radius. And what you could do are, are two things. Either you do non-perturbative calculation for pi in the interior of that Weinstein radius and then expand around it, that's possible. Or it's the other way around. In, the, in that region, you can do actually small mass expansion. So small mass expansion breaks down as you go, go towards the Weinstein radius from inside, and the other expansion breaks down when you come from the outside. But you can do either. But of course, there are some cases, if you do spherically symmetric solution, you can do the exact solution for pi, which is you know, totally non-perturbative, and it confirms what you get through, through those, those expansions. But does it not violate solar system tests? It doesn't, yeah. It doesn't violate the solar system test. That's a remarkable thing. It gives you this pi gets so screened by the Weinstein mechanism is that it gives you tiny corrections to the GR. And in fact, um, in, uh, in, in this model, in the massive gravity, those corrections are way too small to be measured by anything that I'm aware of. But in uh, other theory, which is called DGP, it's, there is somewhat similar story there. So in that theory, those corrections are a little bit uh, stronger. And in fact, the next generation of the lunar, uh, the, the, the precision lunar orbit measurement might be able to pick, pick those corrections. So these are tiny, tiny corrections to the GR predictions. Yeah, very important. But here now, I'm going to address that question 
differently because I'm going to have an exp ex extension of the theory, and in that extension, th it will be solved differently. So that's why I didn't emphasize it. So, so the point, again, I, I'm trying to make this point, is that the Sitter solution is a generic solution. When you, when you write now the Einstein equation, you have you know, conventional Einstein's tensor, then on the right-hand side, you have all these mass terms. And those mass terms give you, uh, they, 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 they exist backgrounds in, in which they, they act like uh, dark energy. Uh, so at the level of the background, then, this is identical to dark energy, uh, to cosmological constant, but the fluctuations are very different. Well, you know that physically they will be different because you have more fluctuate, well, you know, more degrees of freedom in fluctuations, but they are also challenging here because very often, uh, for instance, in the simplest cases, very often those fluctuations become actually infinitely strongly coupled on, on this background that's, that's written here, literally on this solution, they are infinitely strongly coupled. So you got to... You got to expand that theory already for that purposes. If you want to be applying it to cosmology, you got to expand it. Uh, and then this was done in you know many works, notably by uh, people from uh, uh, Japan, from Mukoyama's uh, group, and so on and so forth. But I'm not gonna go into that direction, although it's very interesting by itself. So the brief summary uh, before I go to the new proposal is that so there are uh, in the linearized theory there are uh, three, you know, number goes on bosons of the spontaneously break broken symmetry. Uh, of course, the rank of the group that breaks is a lot higher, but that doesn't contradict number three because it's not a uh, compact group. Uh, counting is different. And those three are the ones that uh, get eaten by massless uh, tensor and becomes massive. And nonlinear interactions then preserve all those five degrees of freedom on arbitrary background. Um, and there are two free parameters. Uh, but uh, on certain backgrounds, you can get instabilities due to the existing five modes. Uh, so it, that, those instabilities are not related to anything new, just the same five modes. And the reason why you get those instabilities is precisely because of these low, strongly coupled operators. So on some uh, very reasonable backgrounds, those strongly coupled operators become of the, of the same order as the, as the relevant operators that you started with. And they, you know, deform light cone in various possible ways, so you can get instability through that. That's another suggestion as to, to the fact that you, you need to go about that scale, understand what's happening about that scale. You see, for the um, massive spin one, you wouldn't think of that, because there we don't think about the backgrounds, we think about scattering and particle physics. While for gravity, you've got to think about background, and if the background is such that it distorts the light cone, then you should, you should uh, address that. So that's another indication that you have uh, uh, something, something, this theory is not complete. It needs to uh, have some extra degrees of freedom which would change that. So here is, here is, a, uh, here is a proposal now how to increase that, that scale. And it's based on the idea that if you had an ADS background instead of Minkowski, let's, let's pretend for a second that we are in ADS space. So in the ADS space, that VDVZ discontinuity is not there, to, as was discovered by my colleague Massimo Porati and, and also, I think, simultaneously, yeah, by Jan Kogan and Muslopoulos and Papazoglu at the same time. So in ADS background, you have an additional scale, which is the scale of your curvature, uh, and then if you take mass goes to zero, that, that, that limit is continuous in the linearized theory. Uh, and uh, reason reason why that's happening is because uh, in terms of the helicity zero mode, the helicity zero gets an additional kinetic term, this one here. It's proportional to the cosmological constant of ADS space and the mass of, of that uh, mode. So in, in, in the previous considerations that, uh, that uh, gave rise to the VDB this kind of strong company behavior, there was an implicit assumption that no additional kinetic term for pi exists. And in Minkowski space, that's a consequence of the symmetries. So there is no way in a Poincaré invariant theory you can get anything here because this is, not, this is not an arbitrary scalar. This is a helicity state of a massive spin two. So that's also different of this theory from all sorts of theories that people call modified gravity in which arbitrarily you put this and that. You cannot put arbitrarily anything here. Everything is related to each other through representations of the uh, Poincaré group, in fact. So there is no way you can do anything here, uh, but if, if it's ADS, uh, then that enables you to have the kinetic term for pi already at the tree level, which is proportional to the cosmological constant and the mass. And then this kinetic term, as you, if you run the same arguments that I ran on, on that slide, 
gives you additional suppression to the coupling to the matter. Uh, uh, and it, it also will give you additional suppression to the higher dimensional operators. And in principle, if you lived in this space, then you would, no, you would not need to invoke nonlinear Weinstein mechanism, although I would argue that this by itself is a Weinstein mechanism in a sense, because the curvature itself created the extra kinetic term. That's what Weinstein mechanism is based on. See, so here it's a curvature everywhere in space, while if we are discuss discussing the, um, uh, let's say, Schwarzschild solution, so then that, that, that's a, that's a you know, coordinate dependent uh, curvature that, that gives you extra kinetic term for the, uh, for the, uh, for the pi. So, on the other hand, we don't live in ADS space. So we somehow we want to use benefit of this mechanism while still being in, in, you know, Minkowski space or some cosmological space. And the way to do that is to embed the four-dimensional theory into a five-dimensional ADS space. Um, five-dimensional, I'm saying for simplicity, it could be higher dimensional, but let me stick to five-dimensional because that's simpler. So you begin with 5D ADS. And then uh, in that 5D ADS, uh, uh, you necessarily generate uh, a massive theory in 5D ADS. You necessarily generate new kinetic term for the pi, helicity zero mode, which will be proportional to the mass, but also to the curvature of the background. Uh, and if you manage then for your four dimensional slice to be Minkowski, uh, you will necessarily inherit that kinetic term because the volume of that space will be finite if you do it properly. Uh, and in a finite volume, this kinetic term will give you four dimensional kinetic term uh, the coefficient will be just this multiplied by the size uh, of that extra dimension. So you can imagine uh, something, you know, Randall syndrome type embedding, for instance. Uh, you have a brain, you have ADS5. I'll, I'll give you those solutions exactly on the next slides, but this is simplified version of what's going on there. Uh, then, in addition to the standard terms that I talked about, uh, this was the pi kinetic term after the diagonalization, you get a new one coming from the fifth dimension and involving five-dimensional curvature. And that's not in contradiction with anything because your four-dimensional world now is, is a very com complex, complex world. It's a, it's a, it's a mixture of uh, four-dimensional graviton with a uh, tower of uh, kaluza klein modes which have no mass gap. So there is, um, there is a, this aspect that you've introduced the states way below the strong coupling scale of the theory. So in principle, that's what you would expect could help uh, you know, increasing the scale. Uh, but then you, you achieve two things. First of all, coupling of this pi to t will now be rescaled by this number. And if this number is big, uh, then you, you won't have uh, issues with fifth force. Uh, in general, you won't have the VDVZ discontinuity at, at that level, uh, because this has an additional parameter in it, which is the curvature. Uh, and then also it will raise the strong coupling scale because of precisely of the same, same argument. So as long as this is much bigger than m to the fourth, which is very easy to justify, uh, then the rescaling of pi is through this term, not through this term. And then all that, that reduces all the higher dimensional operators to be suppressed by higher scale. So here is a full theory again. Um, so the five dimensional world is, um, Einstein-Hilbert, the cosmological constant, and the potentials for massive gravity in five dimensions. Notice now that because we are in five dimensions, you have one more possible term. Remember, those terms are based on epsilon contractions, and you saturate number of terms by the number of indices that the epsilon can have. So in five dimensions, that's five, one more. Uh, and the definitions are uh, similar to the four-dimensional definitions. I, I use the bars for five-dimensional entities. You define this matrix uh, same, in the same fashion. You have Stuckelberg fields in the five-dimensional space. And you have now a fiducial metric here, which I want to make in more general. I, I, I want to make it to be ADS. Uh, and again, if, you were to, if I were to write by gravity, which I, I will on the next slide, this is very easy to achieve. So you have for that second graviton also a cosmological constant and the Planck scale so that you get this precisely. So the, the matching, the bulk boundary matching is a standard one. The metric, the mu nu component of the bulk metric at z equals zero is, is the four dimensional component. Uh, you, can, you can do this in a general covariant uh, way, but this is in a simplest uh, representation. 
and uh, the, the, the uh, boundary values of the capital phi, cap uh, Bach Stuckelbergs are what we call the Stuckelbergs in the four dimensional theory, and then this fiducial metric of the five dimensional massive theory is a fiducial metric of the four dimensional theory, so there is nothing, uh, nothing new here. Um, but that theory now, you, you write down the equations and it has a solution, which is um, given the ADS fiducial metric, which I arranged for by having, let's say, second graviton uh, with appropriate dynamics, uh, and the coordinate in that second space are phi's now. I haven't chosen any gauge, that's why I keep phi's. There is a solution for the physical metric, which is also ADS. Uh, just like that. And then if you were to introduce randall sand jump brain, uh, you, 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 you actually you go to the usual randall sand jump matching condition because what happens was that this extra, th those k's, they are, they, on, on, on this background, those k's are zero. They don't change any story in the background solution for the randall sand jump, in fact. So it's identically to that. So this is what I already alluded to. So I keep in mind that there is a kinetic term and the cosmological term for the second graviton, if you wish to, and then this one you can take to be small, but the curvature to be the same as, uh, as the one for the physical idea space, and it's a consistent solution in that bigravity as well. Okay. So, okay, then you, then you start working with the theory to try to understand <coughs> all this strongly coupled behavior and, and uh, other aspects, uh, and uh, remarkably, now, you, 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 so, so you can take the decoupling limit, which is similar to the uh, other one. And what, what I said in a simplest uh, kind of simple, simplest type setup precisely carries through. You get this uh, extra kinetic term. Now here I already rescale this pi so that there is no mass appearing in front, but uh, there is there is a there is a, of course mass. And then you look at the look at the nonlinear terms. And because of that rescaling, that mass appears here now. So these are the typically nonlinear terms which gives you strongly coupled behavior in the theory. Uh, and in addition to the conventional ones that exist uh, in, uh, in you know, flat space, uh, flat fiducial space massive gravity, you get now a new ones uh, having something to do with the, with the fact that there is a curvature in extra space. And in fact, those new ones are, 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 are worse. Uh, so you got to take care of them. Uh, you do rescalings, all the calculations. And uh, so this is what you'll find, that five-dimensional theory has a strong scale, uh, which is something that you would expect. It's not just uh, five-dimension Planck scale times the power of mass. The curvature of the space-time also enters, therefore makes it higher, because I'm imagining this curvature is a lot higher than the mass scale, of course. So just to give you the uh, roughly, you know, the scales of magnitude, the bulk is like gut. You can think of the gut scale bulk and the curvature is a gut scale and things like that, which you can naturally do. So therefore, this will be a lot higher than the flat space uh, uh, scale. So this lambda 7, 2 is a five-dimensional analog of lambda 3, okay? And then with that, you also look at what's generated on the, on the brain in four-dimensional space. So you can integrate out exactly the dynamics of all the KK modes associated with this pi. And uh, so you get the propagator in 4D, you get propagator like this. Well, it looks scary, but actually it, it, it has lots of interesting physics in it. So, so all these, uh, if you look at this propagator, which is inverse of this, all the, the, all the poles that you'll see, so these are actually a branch cut. And the branch cut uh, is related, it, it's just the reflection of the KK modes which you have in the theory. So you, it, this is nothing but just the KK mode with no mass gap. Uh, but in low energy uh, approximation, when the uh, momenta are a lot smaller than the curvature, uh, this ratio of K1 or K2, the McDonald functions, it gives you another square root of box 4, and square root of box 4 and square root of box 4 combine into square root of box. So it gives you kinetic term for, normal kinetic term for pi, weighted by the scale as we wanted it or as we expected it to begin with. And because of that, uh, because of that, the scale goes high. Actually, 19 orders of magnitude, you can, you can, you can win through this process. So now, now your new strong scale is 19 orders of magnitude higher than the old one. Uh, and the Weinstein, uh, you, don't, you don't necessarily need to invoke Weinstein mechanism because the VDVZ discontinuity is not there anymore for the arguments that I emphasize. So because I probably have one or two minutes, I want to jump onto the holographic interpretation of this, which is, uh, I, I find it very interesting. So. Now, if, if, if you assume that there is a holographic interpretation, uh, then 
you wouldn't expect to have a conserved energy momentum tensor in your four-dimensional CFT dual because your, your gravity, gravity in, in the bulk is massive and the anomalous dimension of your team you knew should be uh, you know, mass squared divided by the uh, curvature squared. And then you, you would ask what it could be. Uh, so in fact, there is, there is a, you, can do, you can assume the existence of duality and co compare the correlation functions as, as was done in this paper. So what you will un uncover is some kind of uh, non-local non 1PI action which precisely captures all the, uh, um, all the, um, you know, all the calculations of classical uh, gravity theory. And what you, what you find is that this theory, four-dimension CFT, is like unparticles. If you follow that story of unparticles, uh, so this is precisely what you find. The CFT dual is just unparticles, of, of, of mass gravity is just un, 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 unparticle theory. Um, uh, unparticle theory does have diminution. Well, so there's a little bit of ter terminology, but the ones that I'm talking about, it doesn't have T mu. Nu. You can have unparticle theory which doesn't have T mu. Nu. Yeah, then th those are the ones. Sometimes people also call unparticle some conventional CFT stuff which has T mu. Nu. I, I mean the one that doesn't. Uh, and, and, and the interesting thing is that if you follow, if you pursue that, this should be in the question session time. So if you if you pursue that. You can even write down effective 1PI actions and then think of them coming from five-dimensional flat space construction with Lifshitz type scaling. And you just take a slide. You just take a slide, exactly. Four four exactly. From 4D, you, you lose T mu nu. Yeah. In full theory, it has T mu nu, but 4D slice doesn't. So that, that's the best inter interpretation. But very quickly, actually, uh, and making connection with uh, Costas's talk, so you can ask now, is, is there a way to embed this you know, bulk massive theory into uh, you know, more fundamental theory? And you can proceed step by step. So there is a, uh, there is a construction in which the, the bulk mass can be now generated by loop. That was done by uh, Porati, Duff Liu, Aroni, Clark Karch, and, and Keretsis, uh, as Costas uh, cited uh, yesterday. If you stick to supergravity approximation, that's fine. but if you want to do it in a full string theory, there are some issues as Costas was uh, pointing out, but uh, going step by step, even in this theory, you can address what's going on, and then ho hopefully you can, uh, you can address in the context that uh, Costas is developing uh, with the postdoc here. Uh, so so I, I, want, I want to review this because it was very nicely done uh, yesterday, in fact, but you can precisely repeat that construction in the case with the brain, with the randall syndrome brain. So you can put in an understand brain, you find the exact solution, and calculate the loop as it was done by uh, these authors. The presence of the Randall Sanders doing it doesn't change it too much, it changes a little bit, but all the, uh, all the same arguments go through. Uh, and uh, you do get generated uh, Fitz Pauli mass term in the bulk through the loop. But this theory is different from the one that I just talked about, in which I introduced mass by hand. And the difference, of course, is that in this theory, you still have bound states of the two scalar fields that you need to introduce in that, in, in that calculation. And one of the bound state is actually the vector that precisely is eaten by the massless stuff. Uh, and Costas had this uh, group theory representations for how, how that works. Uh, and then there are other bound states, right? So however, the other bound states, they don't give you a strongly coupled behavior. So you know, you know what the strong coupling scale of the theory is. It's a, it's a curvature of the, of the bulk. And all you need is to have the first Pauli term generated through the loop. And once you do that, then actually uh, this theory has a cutoff, uh, which is a bulk cosmological constant. And until that scale, it doesn't go strong at all. Uh, all right, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. I'm over time. So, so massive gravity is theoretically interesting. QFT, uh, it's, it's an effective field theory if you if you just are asking a question, can I have just scattering of five heli helicity states of a massive spin two on flat Minkowski space? The answer is yes, you can have uh, until energy scale, which is lambda three. And that's, wh that's where it will uh, break down. If you are asking um, more refined questions as to whether you, you, you can be using this for cosmology, uh, that, that, that those questions call for completion of this theory with additional degrees of freedom. It's somewhat similar in the standard model in which you have to have Higgs boson to go beyond the uh, scale, which is V. Uh, as to what that sector is, is not very clear. Uh, for sure, it, it is not spin zero or spin one or spin a half exchange. Uh, it's something more complicated, remains to be seen. And this exercise that I showed you in which the scale got uh, you know, raised due to essentially the Kaluza claim modes without, uh, without a gap 
that tells you that some spin to should should be participating in the whole uh, whole uh, solution of that, that theory, which is another indication for the same thing. But if you just uh, take very pragmatic approach and say, I want to have cosmology out of in this theory, then you can achieve 19 orders of magnitude increase of the scale of this lambda 3 if you just introduce the bulk, bulk mass. And uh, well, hopefully, uh, this loop generated graviton mass is more fundamental way of thinking about this theory uh, in the context of supergravities and perhaps. Uh, in the context of string theories, once Costas is, is uh, done with his construction, we can also apply that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just to understand, in, in the case, the ordinary case where you cannot raise the scale of lambda 3, and you have a lambda 3 which is very low energy, uh, electron volt or whatever, so what in a physical sense, then, uh, what should we see experimentally in low energy gravity? <coughs> there would be new modes. I mean, the, the, you are saying we need a new theory. Uh, well, it, it depends what you presume about what happens at that scale. Yes. If you insist that there is no new degrees of freedom, that's how the theory is. Yes. That the in that case, so in, in that happen in that case, it's there is a one. So there is a refinement that you should do, which is that there is a Weinstein mechanism. If, if you put this in a, you know, some, some cosmological context, let's say FRW, or even if you, in, in the context of today's universe, let's say in the solar system, right? So those kinetic terms will get renormalization through the classical backgrounds already. Those classical renormalizations drive lambda 3 to shorter and shorter scales. So they prevent you to see new effects that might potentially be at lambda 3. However, if you follow realistic numbers, let's say in the solar system, still the effective breaking scale would be somewhere which, in which you can do measurements. Uh, as to what they are, it's hard to say because you cannot do analytic calculations, right? You have to resort to numerics, but you know that at that scale, there's something, something should happen. So but you should change the theory, or you, or you are saying the same theory can <coughs> still predict in principle? In principle, if you were to do to be able to do non-perturbative calculations in a realistic so setup, you don't have to change the theory. You, you get some predictions out of it. Question will be, are they ruled out or not? This was similar to what I was referring to, uh, more clearer case of massive spin one. Let's say massive spin one, you don't adopt Higgs mechanism. Just put it by hand, the Glashow model. So you get this strongly coupled behavior of the number of Goldstone bosons at, at V. So, so in that case, uh, you know, we have a little bit better control because we can think of the bound states of those uh, helicity zeros into, you know, some other higher, higher uh, mass composite objects, similar to composite Ws and Zs and so on and so forth. And then there is a whole theory, there is a whole effective field theory for those modes and what predictions they would be making for uh, accelerated experiments and et so, et so on and so forth. Let's say 10 years ago, that was still a viable approach for the standard model. You know, people made predictions for the LHC, except that they all got ruled out by discovering the Higgs, Higgs mechanism. So it's similar here. If you are able, kind of willing to leave with a strongly coupled behavior and provide a mechanism or, or a tools of cal calculation, let's say a lattice calculation or, or anything else, well, you can test those ideas. But this will be quantum effects then on the macroscopic scale. Well, they might be. Or, also classical too, also classical too. Uh, so so it's, it's a combination of, of, of the two. So, so I, I'd say quantum in a classical background, that's what I would characterize, yes, true. Uh, so, but, uh, but the point is that fundamentally as a field theory, you want to ask that question, what happens about that scale? Is there, can I resolve that scale? Actually, one good question is, can this, this graviton be a bound state? For massless graviton, you have all, courts, all kinds of theorems pro pro prohibiting that it, it to be a mass bound state. This one, there is no a priori uh, impediment uh, at the level of no-go theorem. Perhaps it's a bound state. If, if, if it is, then, then you can uh, resolve it, perhaps. So but th those are interesting questions. Or if you don't resolve, then is there a generalized Higgs-type mechanism? And we know that it cannot just be you know, one spin, one particle, spin, zero particle exchange. It has to be something more complex. This also indicates in that direction. Costas. Any big questions? Just to make sure uh, I understood this arrangement of the breakdown scale by 90 or 30. Yes. 
is compared to what scale? Is this the usual lambda 3 yes. in the M square and plan? That's exactly right, yes. So it's 19 orders of magnitude compared to that scale, yeah. So it's... Um, uh, so so th this lambda star is what you get effectively in 4D. So this is what you get in 5D, yes. which is nature. This is the same formula that you had, actually, but for 5D. But this is what you get in 4D. Yes. Uh, and as you see, instead of one power of mass, right. you have power of curvature. So it's compared to this scale that you can still uh, use? No, it, this is the high scale. It's compared to... Okay. Right. Yes, last uh, question. You probably explained it and I missed it. I didn't quite understand how do you evade the command I don't understand of energy but you have arguments about scattering and the phase shift of time delay. Well, uh, so, so, uh, right, so, it, so this is what, when, what I alluded to when I spoke about uh, the parameter range for, there is this alpha, so in this notation is alpha 3 and alpha 4, uh, and in the, in the decoupling limit I call them alpha and beta. So there is a parameter range for, do, for those for which uh, the superluminal scattering is not happening, and that first paper that did that was uh, by Cheng, and um, I cited it somewhere. Yeah, so I, I had it somewhere cited, I, okay, I cannot find it now, but anyway. Uh, when you embed it in ADS? Yeah. So when I embed in ADS, actually, if I go by the option in which, uh, th in which those, um, so, so those operators are very much suppressed, this gives you additional benefit in, in those, those, those conversations. So you can, you can imagine that you would have, again, this similar parameter space, perhaps even broader parameter space, for which you would, you would not encounter those issues. But if I remember, well, the problem is where alpha 3 and alpha 4 are driven near zero by these limits. And, and this point is a point where the Weinstein mechanism does not work. So you, yes. you close in or you zero in a very dangerous phenomenological region. No, 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 no but, but the whole point is that the, the pi doesn't couple to stress tensor anymore. You don't need Weinstein mechanism. That's the whole point. Yeah you, you, yeah, you raise that, but also there is a linear screening of pi now. You don't need nonlinear screening of y. You see? So let me... Limiting theory where alpha 3 and alpha 4 equal 0 no, has no problems? Uh, the alpha 3, oh yeah, yeah, exactly. In my notation, yeah, exactly. If you take, if you take alpha 3 and alpha... Even to this point, no? If you, if you take these terms to 0, uh, it won't have that problem that you are referring to. I don't remember if it may have the uh, superluminal, superluminal scale. Yeah, probably, yes. So is this a safe theory, alpha 3 and alpha 4 equals 0? I, 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 believe, I believe it may, may, may not be for the, for the reasons that Emmanuel was saying. I think the parameter range, which is not ruled out, has non-zero alpha 3 and alpha 4, if I remember right. Driven exactly to alpha 3 and alpha 4 equals 0. The small regions in the, these graphs. Yes, but it's, I, I'm using different... Uh, I'm using different coefficients. There, there is, the point is that there is, there is two parameters, and then there is a parameter space, and in some yes. linear combination of them, when both go to zero, there is a very special point, and there is a whole kind of, uh, you know, circle around that, which, which addresses all those questions. I mean, yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's yeah.